Humans appeared about 200,000 years ago, and I believe we count as a threshold in this great story. Let me explain why. We've seen that DNA learns, in a sense. It accumulates information, but it is so slow. DNA accumulates information through random errors that just, some of which just happen to work. But DNA had actually generated a faster way of learning. It had produced organisms with brains. And those organisms can learn in real time. They accumulate information, they learn. The sad thing is, when they die, the information dies with them. Now, what makes humans different is human language. We are blessed with a language, a system of communication so powerful and so precise that we can share what we've learned with such precision that it can accumulate in the collective memory. And that means it can outlast the individuals who learnt that information and it can accumulate from generation to generation. And that's why as a species we're so creative and so powerful and that's why we have a history. We seem to be the only species in four billion years to have this gift. I call this ability collective learning. That's an awesome, awesome lecture by a man named uh, David Christian. It's a TED Talk that's called Big History. And it sort of examines history on large scales and gives interesting observations about the way that the world works. And that one is an example of how human beings use the historical record of information that we have and are able to grow from it in a way that's not really seen in any other species. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the May 16th TZM Global Radio Show. I'm your host, Bakari Pace, and I'll be with you for the next 60 minutes. I got a ton of information to get through, so bear with me. But I guarantee you're going to really enjoy yourself with this show. So, um, first some announcements. Uh, as you know, the Zeitgeist Movement has begun an international campaign called the One Planet Project. The kickoff of which was this past weekend. So if you're just learning about this campaign, it's described on www.oneplanetproject.net. Um, the description there is, it's a simple local chapter project that directly engages the local community. An effective, creative platform for opening communication and education with the general public about our current world and the many problems we face as a global community. And heading into the future, how we can begin to work towards making a difference. So if you scroll to the bottom of OnePlanetProject.net, you can see a map of all the chapters participating in this awareness action. Uh, besides the chapters up and down the east and west coast of the United States, and the major European nations, uh, TZM chapters were active in the One Planet Project in Brazil, New Delhi, India, Seoul, South Korea. Um, the Philippines, for instance, they asked me to shout them out um, personally because there's a lot of good work going on over there in Philly. Uh, Moscow, Russia, Tromso, Norway, Istanbul, Turkey, Thessalonica, Greece, Naples, in Italy, Porto, Portugal, Canada, Hawaii, Colombia, the list goes on and on. And I hope you see that this is representative of the fact that we are an international global movement in this campaign. I'll introduce the rest of the population who may have somehow avoided our presence to the movement in terms of, its, of our train of thought and our literature. So big, big shout out for you who are listening, who are involved in OPP this past weekend. And this campaign is ongoing. So I encourage you to hurry over to OnePlanetProject.net, click Get Involved and get more information about our international campaign. For most of you, this is the first time you're hearing my voice, so I think it's proper that I'll do a short introduction and get into my program. What I'm going to be focusing mostly on is scholarship, academic roots of the Zeitgeist Movement, where a lot of our lexicon comes from, and where you can sort of begin to see where our information sort of connects with other people. That way, and one of the things I notice a lot when I go to town hall meetings, a lot of um, new members and even a lot of older members, when I talk to them, they ask, hey, um, what are some books that I can be reading? What is, what is some information that I can get so that I can begin this sort of learning process, which 
it's a fair question, completely fair question. And what I hope to do in this Brave Your Broadcast is sort of answer that question from the inf from the work that I've done and to also give some tips on how to do that yourself. Before I go on, the Venus Project's recommended reading list is phenomenal. There are authors on there that are just not going to be told, told to you in any academic setting. You have to actively be searching for these people. Um, I would have never heard of Thurston Veblen or Stuart Chase or Clarence Darrow if the Venus Project hadn't put that to me. And that's, that's a really, really sad notion when I think about it is because these people really did change my life. So I really do thank the, uh, the Venus Project for making that reading list. However, I'm going to be giving an updated reading list at the end of the program. You'll be able to get that document from me. You can reach the document if you just go to the facebook.com slash tzm.ga, which is the state Facebook chapter for the Georgia U.S. chapter. So uh, my name is Bakari Pace. I'm a New Yorker. I'm an African-American. I received my undergraduate training at a historically black college in Atlanta called Morehouse College. Now, if you are somewhat up on civil rights um, history and sort of the history of social change, you should know that Morehouse, along with many other colleges in the surrounding areas, such as Spelman College, Clark College, I mean, Clark University, no, it was Clark College, Clark College and Atlanta University, which have now merged and become Clark Atlanta University, that and Morris Brown College, you can never forget that, um, those were schools that were the hubs for 1960s uh, civil rights activism among students. Martin Luther King graduated from Morehouse College in 1948. In 55, that's when the, the sort of, I don't want to say the beginning of the modern civil rights movement. I'd rather say the beginning of the Montgomery Boys, uh, bus boycott. And that sort of kicked off the national, the national audience for the modern civil rights movement. So a lot of social change agents came through that environment there in Atlanta. And I sort of see myself following their example. I was introduced to the Zeitgeist movement in 2010. And one of the things that impressed me most about the members was that there was this general insistence on scholarship. Um, I joined the Georgia US chapter and was immediately working on awareness projects. Uh, and members were constantly recommending this book, that book, all in the interim between projects. Some of the projects we did um, in Georgia chapter, I'm now the, um, the, the state coordinator for Georgia. Um, some of the projects we did, we did food drives, clothing drives. We connected with other um, activist organizations and attempt to sort of bring, to bridge differences, bridge differences of communication, not to berate them for any reasons, and uh, give them the, a perspective on what their activism is and how it can be greatly improved. We did that at the Occupy Atlanta uh, a lot. Now, some were even working on film projects, lectures. There's just an incredible amount of work coming from the groups. In this group, the TZM.GA, I had barely heard of weeks prior. However, I didn't really appreciate the truly global nature of our movement until I began to travel. So in, about, in 2011, I decided that I would begin an intellectual journey, an intellectual journey that would culminate in a book that, I've going, that I'm going to be completing by this coming Labor Day. I see the project as sort of a companion guide to Zeitgeist moving forward. Hopefully it should be something similar to that, which should source a lot of the material that I saw inside the, inside of the book. I mean, inside of the film, excuse me. So the first thing I needed to do was read. So I got the Venus Project's recommended reading list, and I heartily devoured there are so many authors I had never heard of before and actually have now become daily staples in my life. Then in um, August 2011, I met Jock Fresco and um, Roxanne Meadows in Venus, Florida. In 2011, I came up to New York City. I actually came up here so I could witness Occupy Wall Street. It was really, it was really eerie to see people protesting in Lower Manhattan. In much of the same fashion as I had seen depicted earlier that year in Zeitgeist Moving Forward. 
Um, I went to NYU to meet Dr. James Gilligan, who, of course, was featured in the aforementioned film. And he graciously allowed me to audit his class. His class was called Terrorism, Nihilism, and Modernity, which examined the 17th century scientific revolution and its emphasis on universal doubt and how it challenged the age of faith and notions like good and evil, sin, and finally the political and moral authority of the church, and how the rupture that happened after that escalated violence and influenced violence thereafter in the global culture. And most importantly, we question whether modern science could help us understand how to reverse that violent trend. Um, during my time in New York City, I, writing and speaking, I also went to the Buckminster Fuller Institute. I got a chance to see some of this information being talked about on the mainstream. Um, to, for instance, Buckminster Fuller received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Ronald Reagan, actually. Also, um, through some of my friends, I was introduced to some uh, professors at Columbia Law. One professor allowed me to sit in for his class, which was really awesome. So I did an incredible amount of independent scholarship. None of this was trained. I did this all on my own. And finally, I met Peter Joseph. Um, we met at Columbia after the Art of His Film Festival. We had um, opportunities to sit down for dinner and had a. it had to be about three hour conversation. It was really really interesting, uh, memorable moment. So one of my friends asked Peter, hey, what movies do you watch? And Peter's like, I haven't seen too many movies. And I asked him my favorite movie, which is Inception. He said, oh, Inception. I like that movie, but it was pretty long. I said, you just released a movie that was three hours. <laughs> so yeah, that was, um, that was a pretty cool experience. So that's a little bit of my background. So to prepare for this um, radio broadcast, I got in touch with everyone who I know who was interested in these type of topics. I called down to Morehouse. I got in touch with the Martin Luther King International Chapel. And I got in touch with one of my mentors named Roy Kraft. And I said, hey, I'm going to be speaking to a really large audience. What do I what do I tell them? How do I impress certain things about the necessity for scholarship on them? And he said, listen, you need to let them know that oppressed people have always been denied an education. And I thought about that. Oppressed people have always been denied an education. We live in an age right now of immense access to information. And somehow we still don't have that education. I think it's a, I think one of the big issues here is that we're not able to make the time or and, and not only we're not able to make the time, we're not able to recognize the necessity to make that time. Um, second, when people are interested to an idea, they tend to become really dogmatic about it. Or they're not really open towards looking at new information especially information that's counter to what they the what they believe and to mitigate this information overload we're outsourcing our memory and our capacity to communicate to the internet i meet so many people inside the movement who are not able to communicate some of the principles that we talk about and instead point to peter joseph's film and say hey you should watch Zeitgeist moving forward because I and essentially what they're saying is I don't know how to communicate to you. So I'm going to tell you to watch the movie or I haven't done enough research on this. So I'm going to tell you to watch the movie. Now, that's a humble approach. But at the same time, you also need to be able to grow. That way, your next interaction with a person does not leave you needing to point to a movie you should be able to point internally to information that you've been studying on your own. The movies, Zeitgeist Moving Forward, Zeitgeist Addendum, and even Zeitgeist the Movie are only starting points. They're only introductions. Your process here, the Zeitgeist Movement member, is to find out the sources for those information. Because Peter doesn't have any obligation 
to give the sources for his information. He gives his thesis, he supports his thesis, and that's the end of the movie. What you should find out, especially if this is something that is intriguing you, is what are those sources? Because Peter's one man, you're not going to be able to get him to answer that question every single time to every single person. You're going to have to do some active work on your own. That goes to the broader idea that our survival really depends on our ability to grow in wisdom. Specialization and information overload gets in the way of us being able to access the human record of knowledge. So specialization and has been something that Jacques Fresco has talked about often. Because people are narrowing their ideas, because it feels as if there's too much information out there, because we narrow the field and say, this is what we're going to focus on. We're only going to look at this information. We're losing a lot of information that exists in the human record. You can learn from everyone. Literary Americans, that's almost 10% of the population. From that, we can sort of extrapolate that there are millions more who are not functionally literate, meaning they can't read heavy text. And from that, we can extrapolate that there are millions more do not think critically, and that's just in America. So I recognize I'm talking to a global audience. There are people in the UK who are dealing with higher rates of Ill illiteracy, people in India who are dealing with higher rates of illiteracy. The movement should represent a minority of people who do. Not only should we also have the ability to critically think, but also be able to impress that ability onto other people, effectively communicate the necessity for that to other people, and do it in a way that is non-violently communicated. And that's really important, ability to communicate to people in a way that gives them a overwhelming desire to learn. Okay? Now, we can go on and talk about how difficult it is to learn in certain societies I mean, in Atlanta, for instance, by after ninth grade, um, dropout rates just skyrocket. By graduation, nearly half of all Atlanta's kids who began in the ninth grade with each other have dropped out. Now, this has a lot to do with the distraction culture, how media right now is serving to the lowest common denominator. You see reality shows and all of this nonsense on television, stuff that does not really help out with your mind. And one of the things you've got to realize is that as education standards drop, freedom drops. People are not able to find freedom when they don't have an education. Why? Because most people cannot recognize what freedom is without an education. So there is a need for us to be informed activists. Gandhi constantly developed his scholarship. Constantly. He was a lawyer. He studied case law. And, and with the people who followed him, there was a depth of understanding about the way in which the society operated. The people who walked up and accepted blows, these are not always people who were just bandwagoning. These are people who were studied in these concepts. Now, weaker, mo weaker movements tend to go really light on scholarship and focus heavily on street activism. Those are never the movements that you hear about. The movements that affected change are the movements that went really heavily on scholarship. That's one of the things I've always appreciated about the Zeitgeist movement is that there's that emphasis on scholarship. Peter Joseph has done about 18 lectures, constantly sourcing his material. Ben McLeish has done the same. Douglas Millett has done the same. Frederico has done the same. People who are going out and demonstrating this information on the public scale and showing the proficiency in this information. But when you go weak on scholarship, meaning you, again, outsource your, your, your ability to communicate, and you give that to Douglas Millett, or you give that to Peter Joseph, rather than harnessing that yourself and becoming a stronger, a stronger person for it, and you lose a lot in the outrun. You have to be able to respond to people when they ask, why is the resource-based economy a better model from a moral and an intellectual perspective? 
you got to know what you're talking about in terms of legal realities. You got to know the history of social change and you got to know the history of other movements. We have to have people who are trained and excited about making positive social change. You don't want to be a misinformed activist, but part of your education process means you need to be just as familiar with those who are counter to your viewpoint. For sometimes I see a provocative piece. I'll send a provocative piece that is either for my position or against my position. And I'll send that piece to people who I know are completely counter to what I believe. And it's not that I just want to antagonize them. I know they don't like it, but I want to know why they don't like it. Because if I don't know where they're coming from, I can't work for any type of change. In Martin Luther King's book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos and Community, the last chapter of his book is, from, is an adaption of his Nobel Peace Prize. And he talks about the global community or the beloved community. And one of the things you can see in that is this emphasis on avoiding tribalism and necessity for conflict resolution. He says, you can't intentionally shame people. You have to have compassion for people who think differently. You have to look at people from a perspective and realize where they are in their mental development and connect with them so you can have conversation. You don't want to harm people's dignity in the way that you communicate with them. So that's why when people share different counterpoints, you do, you go out and you reach them and you say, hey, what's your ideas on this? And the reason we're doing this at the end of the day is for, five, is for about six reasons. We need to do research. We need to know what the problem is. And we know how to know how widespread our problem is. That's very important. In fact, the Zeitgeist Movement has been really, really good at explaining what the problem is. We need to be able to be active in public debate. Now, one of the popular ways in which people debate people today and the culture is to do associative attacks, meaning you identify with something, therefore you're something else. That's what people do with the resource-based economy. They say, hey, you're against property, so therefore you're a communist. That's an avoiding of the argument. What we need to be able to do is to defend our information to individuals who are clearly less informed about your subject than you. We're also working in consciousness raising, introducing that community to issues that we engage in. On some levels, we're also interested in legislation and policy making. So how that occurs is through the process of education. We publicly inform and therefore you see the society stru being structurally changed by the ways in which we inform people. We want to involve the technological development, meaning we're talking about these different ways in which the society can be operated. And then we look and see technology shaping itself towards those goals. So you start seeing 3D technology showing up at different um, science fairs. You start seeing aeroponics and hydroponics. You start hearing the words geothermal energy jump into the national scene. You start hearing these conversations happening because we're shaping the way that the communication is going out. But the way we're doing that is by being informed activists. And finally, we start seeing changes in social practice. We start seeing people in different ways. They're uh, affected in different ways. And um, the way that they're looking at the world, the way that they're acting inside the world is, uh, is affected because of the information that we're giving out, being an informed activist. Now, that's really difficult to do. Those six points are really difficult to do considering we live in this age of distraction. There are so many things that are competing for your attention. But you have to understand the biggest hindrance to society is keeping people dumb. The most profound thing the establishment does is keep people uninformed about what's actually possible. And if you do that, if people don't know, if you, have, you meet people all day who have unlimited possibilities. But you restrict their possibilities and you can control them. The technology is so powerful. This information age is upon us. And we have the ability to influence many, many people in an incredible way. I think it's time we capitalize on that and make it our mission to spread truth as far as the information is out there about technology and how we can create this world of abundance. Now, without a doubt, with all of this, it's hard work.
You have to stay balanced. If not, you're going to burn out. So you have to form interconnected communities. TZM support is a great example of that internal community inside the Zeitgeist movement that's interested in trying to work with smaller communities of the movement for support issues. Because it's not just during the marches and the speeches and the lectures. It's not just during the times of action that you're concerned. For instance, the Zeitgeist movement this weekend in New York City is having a, a Zeitgeist Day, a Zeitgeist Social. It's going to be happening at Central Park. This is an example of how even when the organization is not in active arms, you're still working and connecting within your own community and creating those social bonds. The next thing I want to talk with you about is social change. The Zeitgeist Movement is a movement, an organization that seeks to see change in the the ways that things are done currently. Uh, we want to move forward the culture. But you have to understand there have been movements before. When you start to look at the civil rights movement as a model, you immediately have to start looking at the Gandhian movement for freedom and um, independence. You also have to look at the Black Panther Party. You have to look at so many different social change organizations. You have to look at the Bolshevik Revolution. You have to look at all of these organizations or all of these events and, and, and planning stages and to see where they went right and see where they went wrong. Were they a violent movement? Were they a peaceful movement? Who are the people who are the antithesis to the people who are inside the movement? And what were they talking about? Who were the people who were the loudest against that person? So you got Martin Luther King. On the other side, you have Malcolm X saying the exact opposite. And seeing where they grow. One of my friends yesterday said, you have to always take a concern about how these people ended. It's not always just the glamour and glitz. It's not always the, um, the Malcolm X who spoke about Uncle Tom's, but also towards the end of his life where he starts looking at the world as a bigger, larger interconnected community. It's not just the king who said, I have a dream, but also the king who made it to the top of the mountaintop. You have to look at, at all of these different people who were influencing and affecting social change. Now, on another level, that doesn't mean a complete rejection of American society. If you're an American, I read um, Dreams of My Father, which is the autobiography of Barack Obama. And inside it, you see that sort of internal um, academic struggle. You see a guy struggling with lots of different concepts. And I can identify with that in myself. Merely because he's the head of a superpower doesn't mean I can't learn from him. can learn from all sources. You have to look at this history of social change because that is very important in the way in which you're going to develop and the way you're going to see your movement flourish. Now, the next thing I need to talk about is creating time for scholarship, creating time to learn. Now, I want to talk about what scholarship is. Scholarship encompasses a broad spectrum of activities. It includes the work of searching for sources, analyzing and making cross connections, publishing, speaking, defending, and so on. But it also depends on, a, on certain uses of time for deep reflection for absorption in one's materials. And I will claim it even depends on activities that can appear unrelated and unnecessary for one's work, such as taking walks, having casual and undirected conversation, reading in unrelated areas. My professor at Columbia Law over this past um, semester told us that the way he would take his final examinations and law school exams are, are historically difficult. He would read this question, leave the classroom, and walk around Yale University. He'd sit outside under a tree, and he'd reflect on some of the information that he, was, that, that he had to talk about. And after about 20 minutes, he would come back in to the test exam, sit down, 
and spill his brain onto the paper and hand it into the professor. That's an example of how you interact with leisure time, even in times of great mental strain, you still make time to use your mind to connect in places that may not have seemed connected before, especially when you're under pressure. Because thinking is a slow time activity. You can't speed up the parts of the uh, the creative parts of the brain by Googling more and thinking less. You have to be receptive for these ideas to arrive. Creative thought cannot be rushed, but there are hindrance to creative thought, like mind chatter. This is why some of the best thoughts that you have come to you inside the shower. But creative thought can be nurtured, and there are ways we can learn to quiet the mind and be available to our deeper thoughts. Martin Luther King, in the book that I spoke about before, Where Did We Go From Here, caught a plane from Atlanta, went to Jamaica for a couple months to write his book. He got completely away from the civil rights movement. Most people don't talk about that, that he left because it was hit. The mind chatter was so loud in these areas The urging for his time was so loud in these areas that he had to be able to leave. Leisure is a form of stillness, a necessary preparation for accepting reality. Today's society looks at leisure as the abandonment of work. In fact, when you look at the etymology of leisure, the, the Greek word for leisure is skull. In Latin, that word is scola, which is the English basis for the word school, from which we derive the word scholar and scholarship. See, school and scholarship are contemplative activities in which we begin to engage materials. So you have to give yourself leisure time so that you're able to think and be able to use the information that you learn from books and reading and be able to connect dots throughout the information. So now I'm going to start to talk about some of the stuff that I know a lot of people have been looking forward to, and that is um, the starting points on your discovery, the roots of this zeitgeist terminology, And I'm going to start talking about the updated reading lists and some popular academics and authors who can sort of help you start to sort of see that those roots of the of the information. The zeitgeist movement is unique in this sense that we have a sort of global outlook on humanity. When I look at an organization and wonder if it's connected to the values that the movement talks about. The first thing I look for are the words global or earth or international. One question someone posed was, how big is your we? If your we is America or your we is South America or South Africa or New Zealand, if that's your we, then your we is not big enough. Your we has to be able to encompass the entire earth. So... There are organizations like the the Study for Global Problems, um, the Earth Institute, that's an organization at Columbia. Those are organizations that when I hear them, I say, okay, they have a total Earth perspective. They're looking at the entire world and saying, how do we improve that? Now we're at a foundational similarity. Now we let's see how our... Uh, information interacts with each other. What are you forgetting? What am I forgetting? What don't I have inside? What What do you have in your information? What research materials? What research methods are you using? What are you bringing to the public debate? Back to those first six points. What are you bringing and what do I need from you and what can I give to you? So that's a, um important first step. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Zeitgeist Movement Lexicon. And off the bat, I want to make clear that I'm not going to be discussing 
anything dealing with the monetary market paradigm. Meaning I'm not going to talk about cyclical consumption. I'm not going to talk about planned obsolescence. I'm not even going to have many books inside of the reading list that are going to deal heavily in monetary market economics. The reason why is that the movement has spent a lot of time perfecting its ways of delineating and explaining how bad the current system is. What we need to perfect, especially for people who are talking about the resource-based economy and offering it up as a solution to the public, we need to be able to talk about what is a resource-based economy and how do we define how do we define it and where do where are the um, where's the research behind why this process works? So off the bat, I'm going to run through a list of certain keywords that you can use in communication, and then I'm going to explain. Uh, I'm going to pick out a couple of these and I'm going to explain what they mean. Some of the historical context. So first thing, steady state economy. Was, uh, next would be systems theory. In fact, if you go to Wikipedia and type in systems theory, you will slowly start to see where the building, it, you go through the links, the bottom of the page, it says these are related links. That will sort of show you the path um, in which the information grows and expands and becomes nuanced. Natural resource economics, that's actually the umbrella uh, branch that covers the type of um, conversations that we're talking about. Dynamic equilibrium. Cultural relativism, that's an important term. Um, I'm actually working on a short lecture to discuss the necessity for this system to work and how to speak about it and not af affect people culture culturally. Um, just to give an example from my life, just last week, I was at the at a bar mitzvah for um, a friend of mine, and it was really interesting looking at it because this is my first time being involved in the Jewish tradition, seeing how and 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 the first time being introduced to it, and there's modes and norms and and social values and things that people have been studying their entire life. And when you approach them to have conversations, you have to approach them um, in a way that does not disrespect their norms, does not disrespect their values. You have to be able to communicate with them in ways in which draw, um, create bridges of understanding. So next, comprehensive systems approach, natural law, the carrying capacity of the earth, world resource monitoring, cybernation. One that hasn't been talked about very much, but is one of my favorite terms, is reciprocal altruism. So let's talk about steady state economy. A steady state economy is an economy of relatively stable size. It features a stable population, stable consumption that remains at or below carrying capacity. Who we were just talking about. The term typically refers to national economy, but it can be applied to the economic system of a city, region, or entire planet. Now, this is an entirely physical concept. The idea is that economies are part of smaller, uh, is a smaller subsystem of a greater, larger system. Um, Herman Daly has a great lecture on this. It was very difficult for me to find some of his books, so I had to go to his lecture, but I would encourage people to get um, find his books. Is to look at the steady state economy um, from this perspective. No economy grows into empty space. It enroaches on the biosphere and displaces things inside of it. You have to realize the ecosystem is a dissipated system which loses parts of itself and gains parts of itself through the economy. A growth economy does not merely enroach on the ecosystem spatially, but also qualitatively. The materials are taken out of the biosphere 
The materials taken out of the biosphere are high quality, low entropy, and the materials thrown back are degradable, um, are, are degraded and high entropy. So what a steady state economy does is very similar to what we talk about in a resource-based economy. It stabilizes the way in which we pull from the biosphere and put back into the biosphere. Next, let's talk about the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity of a biological species in an environment is the maximum population size of, a, of the species that the environment can sustain indefinitely given the food, habitat, water, and other necessities available in the, pop, in the environment. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip the rest of the individual lexicon. And like I said earlier, I hope you had a pen and paper out because since so I'm skipping that, you should have been taking notes, writing those down, and figuring out some of those on your own. So I'm going to now talk about some of the books that are on the reading list. I'm going to suggest a couple, and then I'm going to ask you all to go on my Facebook page or go to www.facebook.com slash tzm.ga, and you'll find this reading list on there as well. I guess it's probably important. I'll probably also put it on to the global page through the blog website. And from there, it'll probably also go out to the major um, public. For instance, for those who won't be able to catch the radio show, they'll be able to still see it. So there are a couple central books that the Zeitgeist Movement has. So um, you have The Best That Money Can't Buy by Jock Fresco. You have Critical Path by Buckminster Fuller. Um, you also have the Orientation Guide. Now, the Orientation Guide um, currently is being revised. However, there's a lot of other people inside of the movement who are writing books right now who are trying to get this information now, explaining what a resource-based economy is and the types of things. Um, just a couple months ago, someone released a book. Um, it was just popularized on the global page. Let me get the name of it. Oh, The First Civilization. Um, you can find that on the blog website. I'm going to be releasing a book um, on Labor Day, and that'll probably also be released through there. I'm considering whether or not to do a um, larger um, larger release, but it'll most likely be through the, um, the Zeitgeist Movement webpage. Um, and the Orientation Guide. It's very important. It's a um, it's a very condensed book, and it gets a lot of the information that you need out of it. Now, here are some of the books that were not listed on the Venus Project's recommendation list, but I believe are very important. Now, how I'm going to go about this is I'm going to tell you that I'm going to list out the names of these books. I'm going to give little antidotes um, as I go on to explain what those books are about, the stand the third. But again, have a pen and paper out. That way you have the notes and you can also Google those if necessary. Um, first book is by Chris Anderson and it's called Free. Um, next book would be Why Civil Resistance Works by Erica Chenoweth. That's a very important book. The reason why is because we are interested in nonviolent um, nonviolent social progress, meaning we're going about trying to change the society or call for changes in the society in a nonviolent way. And this explains some of the methodology and the reasoning behind why that works. Um, Martin Ford's Lights in the Tunnel, which is a brilliant ex ex um, explanation for why automation um, is eating up the job sector. Um, the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, Grunch of Giants by um, Buckminster Fuller, um, James Gilligan's Violence, Reflections on a National Pandemic. I was, I'm surprised this wasn't on the, on the, on the earlier leading list, but this is uh, Martin Luther King, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. Alfie Cohn, No Contest, The Case Against Competition. Bill McDonough uh, and Cradle. 
John McMurtry, The Cancer Stage of Capitalism, George Orwell, Politics and the English Language, Daniel Pink, Drive, The Surprising Science Behind What Motivates Us, Jeremy Rifkin, The Empathetic Civilization, Carney Ross, The Leaders, The Leaderless Revolution, Robert Sapolsky, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, Interesting note with Robert Sapolsky, there is a lecture series called Human Behavioral Biology. I just completed that lecture series. Um, Actually, this week, I completed the lecture series this week. Brilliant. You learn so much. I think every person in the movement and really every person who's interested in understanding how behavior, um, how, how behavior is in our society should check that lecture out. Um, however, it's a class. It's not, it's not just a lecture. It's a class. 26 views. I, throughout the time, since about last October, I was, I, when I became aware of it, I had decided that I wanted to get through it. And I was procrastinating, not getting it done. I put my nose to the grind, um, about March, April, and I got it done this month. Hallelujah. But yeah, so that's that. Um, I can't remember if this one's on there, Engineers in the Price System by Thorstein Veblen. It might be on the um, Venus Project's reading list. And um, White Crimes Against Logic. And finally, Richard Wilkinson's The Spirit Level, Why Greater Equality Makes Society Stronger. Now, each of these books you can find on Amazon.com. You can get them. You can pay for them. I don't advocate this, but I know I've seen the majority of these books for free through torrents through uh, and downloads and PDF forms on. You can also see a lot of these people lecture on YouTube and you can um, listen to them, see how they talk, which will help you sort of internalize their voice when you're reading their reading their um, their written words. So. I'm going to get out of here and I just want to, I finally encourage you all to really be active in learning and do, don't let anything stop you from getting that done. Take the time that's necessary to, um, to, to, to put your nose to the grind and get this information in your mind because you have to be an informed activist. You can't be a person who doesn't understand your information. You need to be open to critique and you also need to be interested in information that argues against your point. Oh, one more thing. And on the terms of on, about civil resistance, again, there's another guy named Gene Sharp. I haven't really looked into his books. Somebody recommended me to, um, to bring him up. Gene Sharp, really good, um, really good person on nonviolent communication. So I'm going to hurry up and get out of here. It was great having this conversation with you all. Um, and I'll play my ending music and get out of here. All right. Have a good day.